This video is a summary of two other videos that I posted recently. So all of the content is here, but if you feel like it goes too fast or if you would like to see me work full examples and exam questions, the links to the other two videos are in the description. But are you just going to decide to treat these things as normal distributions when the question didn't say so? Uh, well, you are, because you are supposed, according to the syllabus, to be aware of the natural occurrence of the normal distribution. You are supposed to be comfortable with the idea that if you take a random thing and you measure it, it is likely to be a normal distribution. You can see that the data kind of supports that fact because it has small numbers being bigger and then being smaller again on the other end. You are supposed to know about the normal curve as well as the normal distribution, which is exactly the pictures that we're looking at right now, is what effect the different numbers for mean and variance have on the shape of the curve. So for example, on the A picture, both of them have the same mean because they are centered around the same point, where the variable with the smaller mean also has the smaller variance. And uh, start by focusing on the red one, which is mean zero standard deviation one, that's the standard normal. And think about all the other ones as graphic transformations of this one, okay? What you can see is that always, every time there is a vertical stretch that makes it taller, there is a corresponding horizontal stretch that makes it thinner. It never goes both taller and wider. Because the thing is that even though they are being transformed, all of them have to keep the same area under the curve. And this area needs to be one because it is the total sum of all of the probabilities of all of the possible values of the random variable. And the total probability needs to be 100%. So that is one. The area under this curve represents the probability of the variable being between those two points. So, for example, in the green curve here, that's why we see that effect where the intervals in the data that are closer to the center had more probability than the maybe the same length of interval, but farther away from the mean. You see, these are basically the same width, but this one has so much more probability. It had so many more users of that platform than this one, just because the area is bigger when you are closer to the mean. The area in this kind of picture is representing the probabilities. And it's also the reason why you can never ask the probability of a continuous random variable like the normal distribution being equal to a certain value, let's say negative three, because we see it in the picture. Because the negative three is here and being equal to negative three would just be this line segment here. And a line segment doesn't have area. The probability is zero. So the normal distribution is the only context in which a student in the SL course will be handling a continuous probability distribution. But even for SL students, it is very important to understand the distinction between continuous and discrete. There is a very typical type of question where the binomial distribution, which is discrete, will have you explore things like the probability of being bigger or equal than five is one minus the probability of being less or equal than four, because there's nothing in between four and five, right, for discrete random variables. So if you are not at least five, then of course you are at most four, because there's no third option between four and five. But for continuous random variables, this is different, because continuous variables, that's what the name means. You have the four here and you have the five here, but the continuous doesn't care continuous goes continuously through that interval. There are no gaps. And this is a mistake that I see sometimes. I'm not sure if I would call it common, but it does appear sometimes that like, for example, the student would be interested in the probability of the variable being bigger than 15 here, right? And then they would remember that thing about binomial distribution and say, oh, if you're not bigger than 15, then you must be less than 14. So less than 14 here. But that's not the case, right? Because it's a continuous random variable. Between 14 and 15, there is area. Now, next, he says something very interesting here in the question. He says, you can assume that 95% of the weights are within two standard deviations of the mean. 
So in terms of the picture, within two standard deviations of the mean is this part here. That means that it is between mean minus two sigma and mean plus two sigma. But the interesting thing is that, do you see this information here that he told me to assume 95% are within two standard deviations of the mean? If he didn't want to, he didn't have to tell me that because it is in the syllabus. You are supposed to know but that 95% lies between mu plus or minus two sigma, which is within two standard deviations of the mean, exactly like the question said. He wants the part that is between seven minus a and seven plus a. So he's talking about this middle part of the picture here. Write down an approximate value with two significant figures in a paper one. How am I supposed to do that? Well, the thing is, is that it says in the syllabus that you should be aware that 68% lies between mu plus or minus sigma or within one standard deviation of the mean is 68%. So in last year's question, he reminded you of the number that you were supposed to know. But in this year's question, he just didn't. Instead, he asked you uh, for the number. So write down the approximate value is 0.68. We have seen now an example of him working with the number 95, another example of him working with the number 68, and we have not yet seen an example of this other fact that he also says in the syllabus that you have to know, 99.7% lies within three standard deviations of the mean. So I don't know, maybe he's trying to give us a hint that next time he's going to ask for the number 99.7. It doesn't hurt if you know it, so memorize these numbers and be prepared with them in your exam. This connection between probability and area in this context is something that is very difficult to explain in the SL course without going into contents that is HL. So now we are going to talk about continuous random variables and we start by describing what the probability density function means. The values of that function, which would be the numbers on the vertical axis, those values don't really matter. They don't really represent the probability of anything about your random variable. The probabilities are actually represented by the areas under this curve. Is the integral of that function from one to three in this example, the total sum of all the probabilities in any random variable needs to be 100%. Then in order to get this 100%, this integration equals to one, we need to go from all the way in the beginning to all the A in the end. And that is integrating from negative infinity to positive infinity. So usually we work with functions that do something interesting in a very small domain. And then outside of that domain, they are just equal to zero. Like this function here, for example, it is still true that the integration from negative infinity to positive infinity is equal to one because this needs to be true for any probability density function. But because this function is equal to zero after x equals five and before x equals zero, then this is the same thing as just integrating from zero to five, which uh, helps to simplify the calculations. So the next set of interesting things that they can ask us to do in this kind of question is to calculate all of the measures of central tendency and dispersion. I'm going to start by talking about the mean and the variance because they are the most common, but then we go ahead and talk about the other ones. So remember when we were doing discrete random variables, we also knew how to do all of these kinds of things. In particular, the mean is the expected value of this random variable. So how did we do that? It's supposed to be the weighted average of all the possible values where the weights are the probabilities, right? So we multiply this by this, this by this, and then we add all of those numbers together. Is that we have to take x, which is the value that the random variable is taking, and we have to multiply this x by the probability of that value happening. And then we have to add over all the possible values. So we're going to take the values of x and then we're going to multiply them not by their probability, but by their probability density. We also have to sum that 
over all the possible values of x and adding an infinite number of infinitely small rectangles that have sort of like base times height and the same thing is happening here the probability of the random variable being equal to one is zero and f of x is not zero but f of x is not the probability f of x is the density the probability of the random variable being equal to x the thing that we're multiplying x by when we calculate expected value is not f of x is f of x times dx which is zero because dx is zero you see it is the infinitely small base of that rectangle that we are adding when we integrate. So it's two thirds of the square root of two, right? So two thirds of the way to the end of this part, kind of around here. And yeah, that looks fine as an expected value. The expected value you can think of as if you put your finger here, will the shape on top of it balance on top of your finger? Is that like the center of gravity or will it fall to either side? Uh, it's supposed to balance, so that's the expected value. Yeah, so now that we already know the mean of this random variable, the next thing that I want to do is to calculate the variance. So this is the variance, right? It is also a weighted average of something. This here is giving the weights of the weighted averaging that we are doing. And the integration is part of the averaging process. But this time, instead of taking the average of just the value of the variable, which was the x that we had here before, now we are taking the average of the squares of the distances between the value and the mean. Look, let me point something out here. If you expand this square, you can then separate your integral into three integrals, right? The first one is going to be the integral of x squared times f of x dx. And the other two I want to do separately to show you what's going to happen. This was the second part of the integral. So there are some numbers here that I can take away to the outside of the integral as if I am factoring out that number from the sum. And then this integral that remains here is something that I have already calculated before. This is just the integral that I did to find the expected value. And the expected value was that number. So that's the final result for the second integral. And for the third one, again, this number is going to be factored out of the integral. And that integral over there is just one because it's the integration of the density through the whole domain of the function. So when you put both of those together, minus two of this number squared plus the number squared again, it's just minus the mean squared. So that's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to replace both of these by just minus the mean squared. And when you see it written this way in the formula booklet, because it is both this one and this one are in the formula booklet, uh, it looks so much like somebody just messed up a special product. So I wanted to show you that so that you know that's not what's going on. This is actually equal to this in this very particular special context. Now we can separate this into two integrals. And I know it seems weird to keep that one squared in there, but I wanted to show you what would happen to the mean squared even if it wasn't one. So now I'm going to factor it out of the integral. And what's left here is an integral whose answer I already know. That's the integration in all of the domain of the function from 0 to 2 of just the function. So that's that green area over there, which is 1. So that minus mean squared that was already doing something kind of strange before. In practice, you don't even have to keep it inside of the integral. You can just integrate the x squared and then subtract the mean squared outside of everything. We ask the next question, which is the standard deviation. Standard deviation is the square root of the variance. The mode is the value that has the highest probability of appearing, but not probability in this case, density. So the mode is the number that has the highest value of density. But now I'm looking for a local maximum here and the local maximum of a function is the point where the derivative is zero. Uh, so continuous random variables was a thing that was about integration and all of a sudden I'm taking a derivative here. And you really shouldn't be trying to memorize each one of these things. You should be trying to know all of the concepts. So on the other hand, you have the concepts from random variables, such as the mode is the turning point. 
And on the other hand, you have the concept from calculus, which is a turning point is when a derivative is equal to zero. So those two things you should know. And then when you need them, you put them together and say, oh, so the mode is when the derivative is equal to zero. You should not memorize the mode is when the derivative is equal to zero out of context like this, as if it was a third thing to know, because it's not a third thing. We're talking about two things. The mode is the turning point, and the turning point is where the derivative is equal to zero. So the formulas that we used for calculating the expected value and the variance, they are in the formula booklet, but the fact that the mode is the most frequent value or the value with the highest probability density is not in the formula booklet, and the way to calculate the median is also not in the formula booklet. And what does the median represent? It is the point such that half of the probabilities to the left and half of the probabilities to the right. So we can represent that as an integral. We should be comfortable representing this as an integral. Now, although it is far less common to find that in exam questions, uh, there is another measure of dispersion as well that we are familiar with and we can try to calculate here, which is the interquartile range, IQR. So Q3 minus Q1. And to calculate Q3 and Q1, we're going to use the same strategy. We're going to look for the point where the integral is not equal to 0.5 like we did for the median. We're going to look for the point that makes it equal to 0.25. And we're also looking for the point that makes it equal to 0.75. So the integral of the density from 0 to Q1 is supposed to be 25% function until problem. b is only about 0 0.53 so that's not going to be enough to reach the 0 0.75 that we need for q3 because the median was smaller than b then we can be sure that q1 is also going to be smaller because it has to be before the median but q3 is going to pass so actually the way that we need to calculate q3 we need to take into account this whole 0 0.53 here and then add that to an integral from b to the point that we are looking for. This one that I've drawn here looks like the normal distribution, but when you are only studying normal distributions, it is common to only look at this kind of picture as sort of like a diagram that represents the probability and not as the graph of a function. So speaking of that, here is another thing that you also don't need to know. And this, even the students in the high level course don't need to know, okay, this formula for the shape of the function that makes the normal distribution is not part of any of the syllabus. But I do want to use it to show to you how this uh, stretch and stretch is going to work. So let me rewrite it in a slightly different way. Uh, first of all, this one over root sigma squared here, I am just going to put as 1 over sigma, and then the rest of this weird constant I am going to just leave as it is. And then in the exponent here, I'm going to leave the 1 over 2 as it is, but the sigma square I want to put inside of that parentheses together with the x minus mu. I also want to separate this fraction into two fractions. So now I can see exactly the effect of the stretches when we change the sigma, okay? When we change the standard deviation, uh, say it began as 1, and now it's going to be 2. What is happening here? The x is being divided by 2, and the function is also being divided by 2. And then we remember from graphic transformations that when you divide a function by 2, that is a vertical stretch of scale factor 1 over 2. And over there, the thing that is happening with the x, it is also being divided by 2. It is the same number. It doesn't have to be 2, of course, but it's the standard deviation. So it's always the same number on both uh, fractions. So over there, but it's dividing the x, so it's going to be a horizontal stretch. And we need to remember that in graphic transformations, everything that happens on the x-axis goes the other way around as your intuition uh, says. So this is not going to be a scale factor of half making it smaller. This is going to be a scale factor of two making it wider. So that's how we can say that all normal distributions uh, end up having the same area under the curve because every time that you stretch here, 
you also stretch here by kind of the same amount in the other direction. So those two things together don't change the area.